none of these books were on my TBR. Not a one. That's why I'm so human. <laughs> everybody, I'm Roxy, this is Rocky Beas, and today I come to you to talk about books that I didn't say I was going to read in spite of having created three TBRs for the August-September period, if you count the Women in Translation Month TBR, which already has a wrap-up, and the History Challenge TBR, which also got a wrap-up, so you can check that out down below and in the eye as always, plus a third TBR, which was an August-September TBR. I did read books from there as well, so that wrap-up will be forthcoming, but this is just a really long wrap-up of books I didn't think I was going to read and I ended up reading anyway. Okay, so first I want to tell you about English Animals by Lara Kay. This is about Mirka, a young woman, she's 19, who comes to England for work and also because she was kicked out of her home because she was a lesbian and after living and struggling in London for about a year or so, she goes to work for this married couple in rural England who owns a sort of hunting facility and they also do weddings because they have like a really old family house. The husband is currently a taxidermist and he teaches Mirka the craft and she gets involved with the wife in a very odd triangle. When I read this, I really, really enjoyed it. I found it compulsively readable and exactly my idea of a light read. There are descriptions of taxidermy here and it is a very emotionally intense book, but it is easy to read in a way. I loved that Mirka's voice is so realistic. It is a first person narrative and it does have that mark of someone whose English is clearly fluent and really really good but it does have a couple of odd turn of phrases which give the feeling of okay English is not her first language. So brilliant and it's so subtly done, it's not crass or offensive, it's just right. I found that fascinating to read in such a casual way. I found, however, that this book hasn't stayed with me as much. I would want to reread it just because it was so fun. I don't think it's going to make my top 10 fiction reads, but I did think it might when I just finished it, if that makes sense. I do recommend it though, if that sounds interesting. My idea of a beach read, it's my idea of like, if you're on vacation or you have like a short flight and you want a book to keep you engrossed, I think this is a really good option. Then I finished my classics Penguin cover to cover read, edited by Paul Buckley with a preface by Elda Rotor and a foreword by Audrey Niffenegger. I love this for the visuals. It is a sort of oral history of Penguin Classics book design because Paul Buckley has been the art editor or art director. It goes a lot into how the artists were commissioned and the visions. As a visual book, this was stunning and so interesting. It's so cool to see what they highlighted. But the problem is most of the written sections weren't written by authors, but by the artists. And so they don't really reflect that much upon how to phrase things in a way that's engaging for a reader. There are a couple of discussions that are really worthwhile, but it's more of a visual book. I was missing the insight, that's the problem. Too many of the stories go like this. I was asked this. I had no idea, I was panicking, this is what I came up with, I don't know if I'm happy with it, but it is what it is. Which I get, that's how industries work in general, but especially in design, sometimes done is better than perfect, I get that. But don't put that in a book. If you don't have an interesting story behind the design, then explain how the design captures the essence, or what you wanted to highlight, or what makes that design more likely to be picked up by a consumer than something else. It 
just comes off as very superficial. I do think that Paul Buckley's sections are really good and there are some others that also are worthwhile. And if you are a fan of Penguin Classics, I do recommend checking this because as I said, it's such a gorgeous book. Then I have a lot of ebooks to mention. Basically, I started taking a modern Chinese literature class for which I still have to read one more book. The first one is China in 10 Words by Yu Ha. And this you can read either as an auto fictional short story collection or as a creative essay collection. It kind of straddles that line, but it's really, really great. So basically each chapter is based on one word. So for example, one is grassroots, other is people, leader, revolution, and how that word as a concept, but also in its usage has changed. One of the great ones is copycat where it talks about China's current counterfeit industry and how that speaks to a sort of national pride but also reflects consumerism but it's also a kind of rebellion so it operates on many contradictions and it really feels like this book reflects upon two main axes one is the contradictory nature of China's history and current state and also the passage of time and the transformation and continuity and lack thereof so it's so fascinating but it's also just so fun to read it's actually my favorite book so far out of all the ones we've read it also is very humane and very honest because it draws on the author's childhood and his personal experiences and actually the book is not available in china i mean it must be but it hasn't legally been published in china it's a banned book the translation in english was done by Alan Barr. So please check it out, it is really, really great. It's easy to read, but you can really see that Yuha is such a poignant and observant writer. So I really, really recommend it. <laughs> then I read Red Sorghum by Mo Yan. This one was okay. I mean, it was good, but I don't think it's just to my taste because it's kind of a magical realist novel about the narrator's grandfather. It reflects on what is real in individual and collective history and what is not. It really questions these ideas of heroism, pride, and that was interesting. But I am not a very big military reader. If I'm going to read about the military, I prefer it to be a history, something that is going to give me data. It, it was a me situation. I think it's an interesting book and it's very well done, but I wasn't very much into it. The other thing I didn't like is that I think there is a lot of unexamined sexism. I don't mind, of course, that sexism is present as a thing that has always happened and continues to occur but in books that are pretty modern this was released i think in the 90s so it's not you know a super old book yeah the, the figure of the grandma was very iffy and i don't know if i like it but it is very epic and it is very satirical epic so if you like things like dead souls and don quixote that kind of thing you might enjoy this as well but it does have a pretty big military and revolutionary aspect and that in contrast to a band of bandits which was actually my favorite part yeah i don't know it, that was more personal taste i do think is well done and it has like a clear purpose and the narration is service of that purpose i would be interested in checking more from this author this was translated by the way by howard goldblatt i'm sorry that i keep forgetting to mention the translators then i have the selected poems of colette rice this is what it says on the tin i'm sorry it's very reflective i adore this. I don't remember why I felt inclined to pick this book up now. I just did and I'm so happy I did because it was incredible. I connected so so much with most of these poems. They are very pedestrian in a way. They talk about scenes and very particular emotions but I think scenes it's a very visual selection. She has such a good command of language 
to defamiliarize situations that are so familiar and at the same time paint such vivid picture. The imagery is there, the concept is there, some of the poems are hilarious, some of them are hilarious and grotesque, some of them are very intellectual, but I would say most of them are very visceral in a very tactile way. I can visualize and immerse myself in and feel the textures of what she's describing. To do that while exploring form and sound and not forgetting that and not having fanciful reading, for example, I just love it. I really, really recommend this. I don't know if it's a good place to start as in is it better to start with selected poems over collections? I understand that collections are constructed in a way to reflect an intention, good ones anyway, but when a poet has a lot of collections out there and I come across a selected poems, I tend to go for the selected poems because I like that idea of a sampler. Either way, check out Colette Bryce, please, because she's great. I finally finished Great Pianists on Piano Playing, a collection of interviews edited by James Cook, and this was a roller coaster because it's a very old school book. I think it was published in the 1930s, and the earliest interview is from 1875 or so. The format is very stuffy and very old, which is fine. I found that it really depended on the pianist and what they were highlighting. There were some essays that were really good and of course since I'm not a professional piano player and I don't expect to be, the ones that talked about what it, it was like touring weren't as relevant for me. Some of them were interesting, some of them were just very, very boring. But then there were others who talked about very either practical or abstract matters that really spoke about what it means to be a professional and what makes a performance good and how a professional owns it and crafts from something that's been played over and over again, their own interpretation. Even though I'm just starting to learn, it's still a really useful resource and it made me think a lot, so I did highlight a lot. It's not a book that I would recommend unless you are really, really very interested. It's not like a fun read by any means and it's very long. Some of the interviews weren't good at all, but then some were brilliant. So, you know, mixed bag, still glad I read it. The next book I finished was Lenin's Kisses by Ian Lianke and this was a wild ride. It's this epic satire about a small village called Leiven where only people with disabilities live and this is set within a wider region. The region is an actual region in China. One of the characters, the chief of that region, wants to raise enough money to purchase Lenin's corpse so they can exhibit it in a museum and revitalize the local economy. And for this, he recruits the people from this town to create a traveling troupe. The village itself is run by an old woman called Mama Shan or Mama Chao, who is really worried about the people from live and going because what she only wanted to was create this safe space and then the idea of all of them putting themselves in jeopardy and open themselves to mockery really hurts her and she thinks it's a bad idea but they go anyway. The ending was worth the 500 pages of the book, quite honestly. It is a very intellectually interesting book. It's sort of, again, a commentary on history and how we tell history and how stories are never the full story, you know what I mean? But they also sometimes are just jokes. It would have a word that's very self-explanatory and have a very tautological definition in a footnote and it's hilarious. Problem is that if you really think about it, it's a very offensive book because, and this was one of the points in the course, by the way, the people are very sympathetic, but first of all, they are not real people. They are not individuals. The only individuals are the chief, and the mama. All the others are just stock characters that embodied processes and archetypes that serve to illustrate the narrative and make the point, which is basically explore the ideas of community, you know, and personal development and collectiveness, that sort of thing, in the context 
just the disabilities themselves are ridiculed and they are paraded like a freak show. So it's a very uncomfortable book to consider. It's not an old book either and I get that it's a satire and that's kind of the point but I guess if there was more representation and more visibility, it would be okay to use that as symbolism and as a lot allegory. But since there's not, and this is quite often the type of representation that you see, I just really hated that aspect of it. But also I just think it's too long. It doesn't need to be that long. After a while, the scenes as they are traveling tend to repeat and that's the problem when you don't care about the characters because the characters are stock characters to drive a point once you get the point you don't feel the need to keep reading that said the ending is extremely emotional i don't want to say what happens but they are trapped in a very specific situation and they undergo such cruelty and it's heartbreaking. So I don't know, I feel very ambivalent. I think if you're into experimental writing and want to try something from a different country, this could be a good option, but I had issues with it and yeah. Then I want to tell you about one of my favorite books of the year. Let's talk about love. A Journey to the End of Taste by Carl Wilson. Yes, that is Celine Dion on the cover. So this is part of the 33 and a third collection, which is a collection on specifically albums. There are more than a hundred titles in here and the idea is that anything can be written about virtually any album. It doesn't necessarily have to be written by a music critic. I bought this one because it is one of the best loved ones and I'd heard Ryder from Literary Disco praise it and I've also seen it around in like those best music books lists but I honestly bought it thinking I wasn't going to read it which I know sounds terrible on top of the money I spent on books that I'm already very eager to read I should have spent extra money on books that I feel ambivalent about what can I say I did it and I am so happy I did because I was just craving some good old music criticism that goes into sociology and cultural studies and this was Perfect. I totally understand why everyone says it's so good. This is basically Carl Wilson, who's a music critic who's historically championed experimental stuff. The more experimental, the better, basically. And he says, I've always hated Celine Dion with passion. He's also from Quebec and he feels like he's never been able to escape her music. But as he's grown up, his music tastes have broadened beyond just really experimental rock and so he wants to see what determines taste what taste says about us as individuals but also as part of humanity and societies why Celine Dion is so popular but also so hated and whether he can reason himself into liking her if he considers this album and her as an artist in the same way that he would consider any other review he was doing. So he starts with a biography of Celine as a person, but also as an artist and the impact she had and how she reached her success. And then he goes into this whole journey of talking to fans, going to see her live, but also analyzing the question of taste. He cites Kant and Bourdieu and different ideas of how taste is constructed and the conclusions he reaches are so interesting. It really is one of the best examples I've ever read of taking something so concrete and so mundane and using it as a starting point for a full-on analysis. I love this book so much, just talking about it, I want to reread it, I want to analyze it more because I did mark a couple of things but I need to like reabsorb this. It's, it's so great, I really recommend it if that's the thing you're into because if you haven't read it it really is worth your time. The only time that it drags is at the beginning, if you don't care about Celine Dion. It's not the majority of the book by any means. You still have to get through that part, but that is kind of the point, so stick with it. It's worth it, I promise. I didn't know that people had such strong feelings about Celine Dion. Like, to me, 
she's just a woman who sings the Titanic song. Really, really recommended. I also checked out Sheets by Brenna, uh, I can't read my own handwriting, Tamir or Thamir. This is a YA, I think, graphic novel about a girl who owns the laundromat and she's struggling. Her mom recently passed away and her father is really struggling. There is this ghost of a teen because when people die apparently they become ghost sheep. A lot of people love it and it's cute but it has like zero staying power. It's very cute, it's very pretty, it's like a really fun neighborhood story of let's be friends and save the laundromat. That's kind of it. Um, it's good. You can check it out. Then I want to tell you about Waiting by Hajin. This is the only book originally in English that we read for the class and I despise this book. This won the National Book Award, I think, and that makes me very, very angry. Okay, so this is about Lin, I think that was his name, and he got married very young to a woman his parents chose for him. And this woman is very frail and she looks very old and she represents old China because she has bound feet. And they have a daughter, but they don't really live together, they don't love each other anymore, or at least that's what it seems from the start. And they don't really even live together because Lin works as a hospital, military hospital doctor, so he works like nearby but not there really. He meets Mana and they have a really intense friendship where they both like each other but she is considered almost a spinster because she's 30 or so and she has never thought about getting married until she meets Lin and then Lin doesn't want to lose his honor and he knows it would be very bad if he had an affair so instead he's trying to get a divorce through legal means but the problem is that in order to get a divorce he has to get an approval and every time that they go with his wife Shuju to get the divorce she cries and says she still loves him and that she doesn't want to get a divorce and that's the conflict. <sighs> First, the positives. It is an interesting examination of society in terms of how important the collective versus the individual is in something as personal or as what we think is very personal as a divorce, but it has many ramifications and the importance of honor and your name and your reputation. I think the point is interesting in itself. It also analyzes individual plight because Lin is a very passive character. He's being compared to Hamlet, for example, because he can't decide whether he should act or not. I get all those points. That doesn't take away from the fact that the book is very misogynistic and I hated it, wanted to DNF it. I thought about it. I hated it so much, but I didn't because as I told you in the DNF tag link down below, virtually incapable of DNFing books that are for classes. So I just kept reading. Okay, so basically Lin is this very perfect honorable man who wants to do right by his wife, but we never really understand why his wife wants to stay with him other than maybe it would be advantageous for her to do so, but she's presented as this very pitiful, almost pathetic, childlike creature who represents past China with her bound feet, which is a real thing, but she's not a person. You have to understand that. We don't ever get to see her perspective. We don't know how she feels about any of that. She has a daughter. We don't know how they fare. And I would have to spoil the ending to explain why this idea of her being just a prop for the plot is reinforced, but trust me, it's not good. And then Mana comes, and Mana is sort of this temptress because she's the one trying to goad Lin along and, and saying, okay, leave your wife, leave your wife. Again, it would be a spoiler to say what happens after, but it's like Lin cannot win, poor him, poor him. It's also some what critical of him, but it's mostly an exploration of his individuality, which is okay, I don't mind, but it is an exploration at the expense of the female characters, and that makes me really, really upset and angry. Plus, I don't think it's that well written. I understand that this author writes in a language that's not his first language, and he needs a lot of revisions, and this is a choice that is very much political. I appreciate all of that. I actually sympathize with a lot of his story and I think he's a very interesting person, but I think 
the takeaway and the conclusions you can reach from this book while maybe interesting are still deeply misogynistic and i'm sorry but that cannot fly with me anymore i can take certain levels of ingrained sexism in my old books let's say pre-50s but anything after needs to be critical or i'll scream let's finish this off on a positive note i read good omens by neil gaiman and terry pratchett because i watched the show and went on to become completely obsessed with it so of course i had to read the book i had tried to read this book before but it was a translation in Spanish Spanish yeah, and it was very awkward ask anyone here they'll tell you because the insults and the slang is very different give it another shot this time in English I enjoyed it a lot but I don't think I would have enjoyed it without having watched the show first so the book is about the apocalypse but not in a dystopian way basically there is an angel and a demon and they have been on earth since the beginning since the Garden of Eden and they've become associates and friends and perhaps something else. Crowley the demon gets the task of delivering the Antichrist and they appreciate Earth so much that now that the apocalypse is coming they realize they want to continue enjoying earthly human delights. For example food, music, art, drink, that sort of thing. The book is very funny. It has this very geeky, on-the-nose historical humor. If you like that sort of thing, you would like it. I think it's a very specific type of humor. It can get a bit corny, a bit too much. It is a very exhausting book because it has a lot of digressions and sometimes I wanted to say, okay, I get it, but I do love corny humor. I do love historical. There is a whole running bit about how the angel Aziraphale likes classical music and then Crowley listens to rock and in particular Queen. So Aziraphale finds a cassette that says Tchaikovsky and in the end it's like Tchaikovsky with lyrics by Freddie Mercury, that sort of thing. I love how they talk about most classical musicians being in hell and that sort of thing. It's a very funny book and I appreciated it. But if you had to choose whether to start with the show or the book, I would recommend the show. I think the show, first of all, centers the angel and the demon even more. There are also the parallel stories of the Antichrist growing up and there are some prophecies involved because the subtitles of Good Omens is the nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter, which there is a descendant there. In the book, there are pretty much one third each, whereas in the show, it's pretty much about the angel and the demon, and then the others are side stories. The story ends and begins with the demon and the angel talking, whereas the book, that's more balanced. And I think that's an asset. The show added some historical takes that are amazing. So I just really, really recommend the show and the book as a companion to the show. I know that's not the most popular take perhaps in the literary community, but that's the way I feel. I still had a great time. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It made me happy. The show made me happy. Everything Good Omens related makes me very, very happy at the moment. And that's it. That is all for today. I've been talking for quite some time to the camera, so let's see how long this video will end up being. Tell me if you've read any of these books, if you are interested in reading them after I talked about them, or any other thoughts about books or about life. That's it. See you next time.